Good morning, RCCA. Isn't that nice? A little, a little music before. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, good. Hey, Teen Challenge, I know you're here. How are you doing this morning? Yes, because I saw you guys Thursday night. We had prayer and worship night, and I tell you what, it was amazing. It was just anointed and sweet, and I loved it. I hope you all got something out of it. For those of you who were not here, I'm telling you, prayer and worship nights, when we have them, it's amazing. You really should come to them. So, guess what? Sunday, the 18th, which is next week for kids, little kids who are coming to Sunday school, we're going to have pajama day, and they're going to all have their pajamas on. <laughs> Pastor Marcy will have her pajamas on as well. And they're going to have donuts and pajamas next week. So it's pajama day for the TNK kids next week. Um, next, the week after that, when, Wednesday, ne not this coming Wednesday, but next Wednesday and Thursday, we are going to have the uh, Foursquare Conference going on on our screens here. And you can come, I can tell you, um, uh, Jackie and Cindy and I went and joined a bunch of the staff last year and went to the conference and just heard a lot of really good things about what's going on with Foursquare and just really got us kind of in tune, I think, with and learned. I learned a ton while I was there. So we're going to have that here at the church Wednesday and Thursday, the 21st and the 22nd. And we'll also send out a link if y'all are interested, and you can also watch it at home if you don't want to come and join us. But I'm telling you what, come and join us. I mean, I know you feel it when you're here, the fellowship of being with one another, getting to see each other. So it's really cool if you come and do that. So for tithing, I hope you're all tithing. And, um, you know, I'm just going to make it easy to say that, and I'm going to pray over our tithe. So Lord, thank you so much for the money that we're able to give back to you through our tithe, Lord. I pray that it will bless RCC and that we can continue to reach out and reach more people through the tithe and through the offerings that we give, Lord. And that's it. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Eric. You can stand or sit, whatever you want. Just join me in worship.
Cause when you called my name, I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and i ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and i ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day been to a house, been to someone's house before, and you walk in and it's it's kind of cold. It's almost like too perfect. The key word is almost too perfect. And it just like you're afraid to like even move around in that place. But yet some of us have been in homes where we walk in and it's like <sighs> this feels like I've always been here. I just feel like I'm welcome here. I feel like I'm just supposed to be here right and as we sing this song this morning as we kind of hang out here in this place I want us to every single one of us every single one of you is a house and we could be that house where we're like it's almost too perfect the key word is almost and it's just like and, and it's like we're not no one's welcome there and so what we're singing here is like Holy Spirit you are welcome and maybe that is your house maybe your house is like almost perfect and you're like I don't want anybody to come in and mess things up so can I just tell you right now we are messed up okay it that you are I was gonna say you we are totally messed up and it's the grace of God that comes in and he'll put things in order but he needs to be welcome and so this is our opportunity this morning this is your opportunity to welcome him to actually pray the prayer God you are welcome not in this house yes he is always welcome in this house but is he welcome in this house If he's welcome in this house, you will never be the same. 
You can try to keep everything perfect, but it's not going to be perfect. You won't even be comfortable in your own house. So welcome him. He will make you comfortable in your house. Amen. So can we sing this for a little bit? Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are welcome here. your presence in this place, Lord. We are aware that you are here. My God, you are here to create new. God, thank you that you called us from the grave. And Lord, I thank you that many have answered. Many have answered and we've come running out of that grave. But Lord, I pray specifically right now for those who have not answered. That who had not said, I'm going to run to my Savior and who are choosing death over life. God, I pray, Jesus, that you'd bring life in their hearts right now in Jesus' name, and that, that they would go running towards you. God, we pray for salvation today in the hearts of people that are watching and the hearts of people that are in this room. And God, the hearts of people that are in the neighborhood across the street, just right now on a Sunday morning, all of a sudden that you show up in their life, God, and you're the, what you've been working and stirring in them, that right now it would come to be. And so, Lord Jesus, I just thank you that you come to save us. You are our rescuer. You also come to fill us and empower us to live today to do the things you've called us to do. It is impossible to follow you without your Holy Spirit in us, leading us and guiding us. God, we are desperate for your presence, and you are so welcome here. God, you are so welcome here. So I pray for those who have barely opened the doors this morning and just peep their, 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 their eye through to see I pray that you'd show them, Lord. I pray that your mercy and that your love would overwhelm them and that they would open the door to you today. They would welcome you into their hearts today.
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Awesome. Hey, as you sit down, wave at somebody, uh, hit, hit an elbow, touch an elbow. The foot high five is still in, I heard. Is that still in? High five. High five. High five. Good morning, good morning. So why do we call ourselves Foursquare? Believe it or not, it has nothing to do with our skills on the playground. No bobbles, double taps, or Texas twisters. Back in the 20s, our founder, Amy Semple McPherson, began referring to the message of the gospel as being Foursquare which back in the day meant solid and balanced. Amy's message focused on four essential aspects of who Jesus Christ is, and those aspects are easily represented by the logo before you now. The first box, the cross, represents Christ the Savior. Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God who died on a cross to pay the price for our sins. Because of His sacrifice, we can actually have a relationship with the Creator of the universe. The second box is a dove, which represents Christ as the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was baptized, a dove came down and landed on him, showing the Spirit of God was one with Jesus. The Spirit of God does the same thing today. In fact, we describe our movement as Spirit-filled, because the impossible is possible when people are empowered by the Holy Spirit. The third box is a chalice, which represents Christ as the healer. Jesus cares and is involved in all of our lives. Whether our issues are emotional, spiritual, or physical, God has the power to heal the deepest of wounds and cure the darkest of afflictions. And the final box is a crown, which represents Christ as the soon coming King. Simply put, Jesus is who he said he was, no matter how dark or confusing the world may get, Jesus will be returning one day to make all things right. So there you have it, four squares, representing four aspects of Jesus Christ, making a four-square doctrine that is solid and balanced. We may not agree on every little aspect of how we live our lives as followers of Jesus. As long as you join with us in believing in Christ as Savior, baptizer with the Holy Spirit, healer, and soon coming King, well, your faith sounds pretty four square to us. That's awesome. Amen, amen. So we are four square. We're a four square church. We believe in those four things, that Jesus is Savior, that he is baptizer uh, with the Holy Spirit, that he is he, our healer, and that he is coming back, that he is who he said he is, and he, that he, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's what we believe. We believe in this book. You know, not everybody... Did you know what? all Christians don't necessarily believe in this book? And there's this whole movement right now called uh, progressive uh, Christianity where we are elevating our experience. So our experience and what we experience now is more important. And so our experience can actually, even if it doesn't line up with this book, it's okay because it's our experience. To me, it gets dangerous. It gets really dangerous because... God never contradicts his word. So if God has spoken his word, he's a promise keeper, right? And so then he's not going to break his promises. He's not going to go against what he's already established and what he's already said. And so that's really important for us to grasp, grasp because we're going to talk about baptism in the Holy Spirit this morning. And in, in, in like 25 minutes, that's plenty of time, 35 minutes. Let's add 10 minutes. That's plenty of time to talk about this. It is, I'm going to throw you a grain of sand on the ocean this morning when we talk about the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is God. So how can we talk about the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of God in 35 minutes? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the promise that Jesus gave us and said, I'm going to give you this gift. I'm going to give you this gift. It's way bigger than this, but this is all I could find. I'm going to give you this gift because it's going to empower you, like the video said, to live life here. And if Jesus has called us to do mighty and great things, we cannot do that on our own. Because Jesus also said, apart from me, you can do whatever you want. 
No. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's, he's talking to his followers. He's not talking to the person down the street. He's talking to those who have already committed their lives to him. And he's saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. Then how can, so how can we do this? We can do this because he is, when he left to go to heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit to empower us and to fill us so we can do the will of God. It is a polarizing topic in the church because the church right down the street doesn't necessarily believe in this. And so how do we, like that's why the denominations and all this stuff is formed because humans are involved. How many of you know that humans are messy? Yeah, we're messy. And there's all kinds of, ah, we just bring our stuff to the table and then we read this book and then we start, oh, we start plucking and pulling and that's never really good, right? And so, how do we deal with the messiness? Because there are extremes. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, there are extremes. So I want to share a few extremes and I, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings if you've done any of these things or experienced any of these things. Can I just say about experience, because we just sang that song and we just prayed. Let us, become more aware, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. So the church I grew up in, and I love, and it was my, it's a foundation, that, and that's a, God knew I needed that structure. God knew I needed to be grounded in his word. That's why he had me there. And I love the people there. Most of them are gone. Um, I think the pastor's retired now. My first pastor's with Jesus now. And so, but he grounded me there in his word. But I grew up in a place where you didn't experience things with God. And that's tough because... Tell me that Moses didn't experience things with God. But what happens, and I think what, now from this side looking back, I think what the, the message was is don't worship the experience of worshiping God. Don't worship worship. Because I've had people come to me and like, oh, that was great worship today. Well, it was great worship last week. It was great worship the week before. It would be great worship next week. Well, why was it great today? Because you experienced something today. And so sometimes we put our experience above. Man, God is God. And it could be a two-year-old up here who was at my house yesterday with a little xylophone and just plunking that thing out. And it sounds, I'm sorry if you're watching, it sounds horrible. But in her heart, it was joy. So we can worship, we really should be able to worship to anything. But we experience, so sometimes we worship the experience of worship, and we are never to put that experience above God. God, I come here to worship you. Now, when we come to worship Him, are you going to experience things? Yeah, you will. But don't come here to experience. Come here to worship God. Like Thursday night, prayer and worship night, for those of you that were able to make it, maybe it was just me where I was at personally, but it was like heaven was in the house. And I was telling somebody, if I would have just fallen over on my chair and, and gone to be with Jesus, that would have been a great prequel because I was already there. I mean, Thursday night was like we were already in heaven with him, and he was just speaking, maybe it's just me. I just felt he was speaking so clear in this room Thursday night. Do I worship that experience? Oh, like, well, we're going to meet this Thursday because I want that experience again. No, we are going to, not this Thursday, but in November. But because God is so good and we set our hearts on him, we don't set our hearts on this thing. Like, oh, I want this experience, so I'm going to go and experience this. And, oh, God, you're there somewhere. Am I making sense? Am I, uh, am I trying, helping you kind of capture? 
So that's what happens with when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, because we see extremes. We see extremes. And I made a list of extremes. And I've experienced some of these extremes. So first of all, we believe that Jesus is Savior. You got to come to him first. And you have to deal with your own messiness before him. And the Bible calls that sin. But it's just the fact that we're imperfect and we're broken. And Jesus came to fix that for us and to restore a relationship with God. So that's first. So repentance, like, God, I want to turn away because I know it doesn't work. I'm going to turn away from the things I'm doing. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. And then the first step of following him is baptism, right? So it's an outward, it's something that we do. It's an outward expression like of what God is doing on the inside. So we baptize you in water. And we've usually set it up right here. A few weeks ago, we set it up out there because it was nice. And so we set it up outside and, and we celebrated what God was doing in Douglas. What God was doing on the inside of him and how he's changing that man. Uh, we celebrated with him. So it's a decision he made. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is something God does in you. He just pours out his gifts just like that. <laughs> He's the giver of good gifts. Amen? Amen. So here's this extreme list. So sometimes we're accused of being holy rollers, which I don't even know what that means, but okay. Holy rollers. And so here's some of the things. Like laughing uncontrollably, speaking in tongues, running, slain in the spirit, laying down, barkers, roars, clucking like chickens, playing with snakes, flag wavers, and dancers. Okay? So some of you are like, really? Those are some of the extremes. And there's, I probably could have listed a whole bunch more. But some, those are some of the things that, because we are messy, and sometimes things happen, we get caught up into this experience now I'm not saying can I just say this that God is God and he can do whatever he wants and that's why I pray all the time God you're God you can just just do whatever you just do what you do and I'm going to trust you I'm going to follow you so let me tell you some of my experiences with these things so I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, again, very grounded in the word, and, um, but love, love music. I grew up with music. My parents played country music for a living when I was growing up. So six nights a week, they played country music and old rock and roll music in the local establishments. And that, that's a good word, establishments. You know, so they would leave late, early evening, and then they wouldn't come home to about 3 o'clock in the morning because that's their, their gig was 9 to, 9 to 1. And then they'd go to have dinner afterwards. It's just the way it was. That's the way I grew up. So I love music. And so, and then Hank used to, I'm telling on Hank, I didn't even ask him, but the whole, I'll ask for forgiveness later. Um, he was a country, he was a DJ as well. And so for a radio station, so he'd get concert tickets, so... He would just drag us along as kids to go to these concerts. And some of you are like, oh, right on. There's some really cool concerts, right? No, I mean, it was one of my, my first concerts that I can remember was a guy named um, George Jones and Tammy Wynette in Seattle. And they had this young girl who had just started her music career, and she opened for them. And her name was Dolly Parton. Seriously, I saw the Statler brothers. I saw Mel Tillis. Some of you are like, who are these people? Yeah, don't look them up on YouTube. You'll, you're like, you're lame. Um, so, but that's, I grew up with music and I love music. So when I got saved, music brought in a whole nother thing because now worship. So now I can sing songs that are like directly to God and, and um, it just brought in this whole new thing. So we went to this concert in Seattle, a bunch of us from youth group. And it was the key guy that night was Keith Green. He was going to be the, he was going to be the singing guy. He was kind of the hot guy in, in like 1980. It was, he was the hot. He was, yeah, he was kind of cutting edge. Keith Green was the guy in Christian music in 1980. 
man, 1980 sounds like a long time ago. When I just, when I, when I just said that out loud, I was like, wow, 1980, that was a long time ago. Um, so it was like 80, 81. Um, but they had this band that opened. So I'll go to this place, and we go to this music. And I'm Baptist boy, right? So I'm used to hymns. And maybe once in a while, I'm going to step on these presents. I better pick them up. Maybe once in a while, a, a chorus of, I love you, Lord, you know? And, um, and there's this band that opened up for Keith Green. It was three people, and they called themselves Second Chapter of Acts. And, um, and I just found out actually this morning, because I said, I want to find out a little bit more about this band. I didn't know they were siblings. So they're brother and two sisters. And um, so we're sitting at this concert. I remember I had a side view. So we're right by the stage, but I'm on the side. And they're doing these songs. And they had beautiful music, great harmonies. But towards the end of their set, music set, they just start, like, pointing people out in the crowd and, like, praying for them, but not praying, like, speaking to them. And what we call that now, now that I know on this side, this is they were prophesying over them. That God was giving them words from the stage for individuals in the crowd. And then people were like, their hands were raised, and people were falling over. And I was like, my hands weren't raised, and my hands were like this. <laughs> in judgment, honestly, it was in judgment, like, this isn't right. And that's what I was saying, and kind of saying out loud in my expressions, like, I don't agree with this. But honestly... Inside, what was going on in here, I was saying, they have something that I don't, I don't have. There's something going on here because it wasn't, it was a little uncomfortable, but it was welcoming at the same time. Does that make sense? And so there was this long, like, they have something that I do not have. And so that was my journey, began my journey on, okay, God, there has to be more than just a Sunday morning when I sing, like, three songs, and I'm told when to sit, I'm told when to stand up, and then I'm hammered with this book, <laughs> and then I go home. It has to be more than this. And that was kind of the beginning of my journey, second chapter of Acts. So they'll always have like a kind of a special spot in my heart, because that's where God really started introducing that, hey, I have more for you than just a Sunday morning relationship. It wasn't even a relationship. First thing. So going off this list above, I don't think I've ever been accused of being a holy roller, so we can check that one off the list. I have experienced at times of extreme joy when I've laughed. Never like I don't think I've ever laughed in the spirit, which I have seen people do. Or I just know like their situations and all of a sudden like God just shows up and they just start laughing uncontrollably because he's like installing, like literally installing joy into their life because they just need that in that moment. I can't judge that. Now, can we take that to an extreme? Oh, yeah, because we're messy. I do speak in tongues. Is that okay for me to say out loud? <laughs> the Baptist guy in me just, just cringed a little bit. Now, you know, just honest moments, because I want us to be an honest church. Um, can I just turn it on just like that? Sometimes. But for me personally, it's in worship when I'm like there. Because I have just a lot of junk up here. I don't know about you. <laughs> and so I just have to get to that place. But when I'm in that place... I like being in that place with him when nothing else matters except for being with him in that moment. And that's what I pray for us as a, as a church and as you as individuals, that you're just with him in the moment, always. You could be on your keyboard at work and you're in the spirit. 
Who says you can't? You can be golfing. No, you can't do that. <laughs> but you can. Yeah. I'm not a runner, but I have been in services where people just start running around. I'm like, why? Unless you hit a ball and then run to first base, it's senseless. So why are you running around? I'd rather, you know, slain in the spirit. You know, can that be abused? Have we seen it abused? Yes. And maybe you've been pushed over. Like, hey, I wasn't going over, but someone just pushed me over. Um, I've been slain in the spirit twice. Um, yeah. And it happened back-to-back -back nights. Happened on a Saturday night up in Arlington, Washington. And it happened Sunday night in Covington, Washington. And for me personally, it was just in, in, a, in a time where I was super comfortable in my, my former employment. And I really felt God was calling me into ministry. And it was, was going to be this massive for us being the sole breadwinner in our home and having a four-year-old and my wife who was disabled to be able to step out of a place of comfort into a place of your paycheck comes out of the offering basket. Now the offering box, which is right there, by the way, if anybody doesn't know where it's at. <laughs> um, that was a huge step of faith, and I, it was scary for us. I mean, not for Cleo. She's like, go for it. For me, as the breadwinner, I was like, I don't know. And I just, I went to a John Bevere, if you know John Bevere, and went to a thing, and we were done. It was an amazing night, and yet, did we see some extremes? There was some extremes kind of going on in the room, and but I was in the back door, literally, we were about five of us at the back door, and some of our people were laying on the ground or hands raised, and, and we're like, it's like 10 o'clock Saturday night, let's go, let's get out of here. It's an hour drive, you know, that's, that, that, so that's my spiritual, men, mental space. And there's an older gentleman who was up by the altar, and he pointed in the back of the room. And he said, come, come, come here. So, and I'm just leaning, we're, I'm with my friends, and I'm like, we got to get out of here. Back then I wore a watch. We don't wear watches now. I don't. And then, but I saw him pointing. I'm assuming he's pointing at somebody else. But then he keeps, he starts walking towards where he's pointing. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh, he's pointing at me. And so I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so uncomfortable. Um, but, okay, so I went up to him, and he said, hey, I just really, the Lord has just told me I need to pray for you tonight. I'm like, okay, why would I say no? If, so, if you come up to me and say, Kevin, can I pray for you? And I'm like, yes, please. So, and, you know, I've seen the extreme of, and I've watched TV with the, the holy push, and you want it so bad before anything happens, you just, they just fall over. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, nothing happened yet. I can't judge them so because it's happened to me twice. And so it wasn't like manipu he didn't manipulate me. He didn't, like, wor we didn't have to get th anything worked up. He was as gentle. He almost whispered. I said, can you just put your hands in my hands? So he just put his hands out like this. He goes, just put your hands in my hands. And that's all I remember. I put my hands in his hands, and then I was on the ground. And I just felt the Lord say, follow me. And I had this peace, like this peace that came over me. So, and then I got up, we drove home. And then, you know, the enemy, whenever you experience something with God, you know, the enemy will come and he'll try to pluck those seeds that Jesus has planted in you. And so the next day I'm like, oh, I must have just got caught up in the emotion. And, and you know, so whatever. Well, then I went out Sunday night. The same speaker was at Sunday night out in a place out in Kent. And so a bunch of us said, hey, let's go again. I don't know why we did, but we did. We were just hungry for God. So let's go. So we went, same thing. At the very end of the service, he, he said, I feel like I'm supposed to pray for pastors tonight. And I was like, Phew, because I'm a cabinet maker. 
I was a cabinet maker. And so like 15, 16 pastors go up and then people like we went with, we had about 15 of us that went from here. We're like, you should go up there. And I'm like, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> but they're like, you need to go up there. So I just reluctantly got kind of worked my way into the line. And so he starts praying for people down here on this side and just starts working his way down. And they just start dropping. Boom. 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 He's like five away from me. The guy doesn't drop. And he stays there for a while. Even gets the little holy push. Still doesn't go down. And I'm like, Phew. so I'm not going to be the only one. And I just remember. So literally, I remember being in that moment saying, I am not going to fall over for anybody. God, you are God. And I just pray that whatever you're doing, that you'll do in me. And so he stopped to me. He's praying for me. He's praying for me. He's praying for me. I feel nothing and nothing happens. And he gives up on me and he moves on. By the end of about 15 minutes, I kind of peek. You know, you do the holy peek. You know, like what's happening in the room right now? Everybody, all the pastors are on their ground except for one other guy. And I was like, okay, so I'm not the only non-spiritual guy in the room, right? And the music is playing and all this stuff. He goes back to the other guy. That guy falls over. And I'm like, oh, no, I am the only one. I mean, I'm literally, seriously, I wasn't in the spiritual place. That's what I'm thinking. And so, again, I just pray, God, just whatever you want to do in me, I pray that you do. And will you just show me? what I'm supposed to do, he works his way back to me, and he prayed for me. I'm just thankful that he didn't give up. And they had a spotter, if you've been in a charismatic church, so whenever that happens, they have a spotter. And they're so gracious, because for women, especially in the South, they have spotters with blankets. So when women fall down, they cover them with a blanket, um, just for modesty. So I thought that was cool. No blanket for me, but. Um, so we're, in a, we're on a cement floor, cafeteria floor, but I feel, I feel okay because the guy behind me is about 6'5". He's a bodybuilder. His name is Eric. He used to go here. I'm like, well, if something happens, he's going to catch me. And so I'm like, all right, so God, whatever you want. So remember, I just want to be in that place. God, whatever you want. So I'm laying there. I'm laying there. I'm standing there. And I'm just, I think I'm kind of like this. I was still very Baptist, so maybe I was like this, you know, you know. But just, God, whatever you want, whatever you want. Because I know that God is the giver of good gifts. So, what, God, whatever you want, I want. He's praying for me, and then next thing I knew, I'm on the ground. And if you talk to somebody, if you talk to Cleo, they said it looked like I, I don't remember anything, except for I do remember that just sense of amazing peace. And like, just God reassured me, I'm with you. But I also remember Eric whispering in my ear, sorry, man, because he didn't catch me. <laughs> Cement floor, and Cleo says, because I didn't see it. I would love to see it on video. That would be awesome. But she says it looked like I got hit by lightning because I went down so hard, like my feet went up. And I hit the floor, cement floor, and I felt nothing except for peace and God saying, I'm with you. And then Eric whispering, sorry, man, I didn't catch you. <laughs> can it be to the extreme? Yes, it can be to the extreme. I've seen it. I've seen the same people come every week and just fall over every week. Because I think as humans, we desire God so much that we think that we can make it happen. We cannot make it happen. What we can make happen is a heart that says, God, whatever you want. You are the giver of good gifts. And so I trust that you'll do that in me because you're good. I have laid down face down before God before. I've also laid on my back and just looked up to the heavens with my arms out. Not slain in the spirit, but just 
felt the Lord say, I want you to get down. I want you to just humble yourself, or I want you to look at me in awe and amazement. So I have done that. I'm not a barker. <laughs> I'm not a clucker. I've never roared like a lion in church, but I will say on a mission trip one time and to San Luis Potosi, we had this moment where I know this father and son were re reestablishing a relationship um, on our trip. And, um, and a lot of our young men were really struggling with identity in Jesus and just didn't know and didn't have the confidence. And I remember the Lord just say, I want you guys to huddle tight as a group of men. And I want you to have this like victory shout, almost like a roar. And I'm telling you, in that room, so we did that. And I was such a step, I'm like, oh my gosh, God, is that really you? But we're going to do it. So we did it. And it was just the guys. And there was about 15 women in the room and girls. And they were all weeping because of what God was doing. And the noise in that room, it was deafening. And then, but for the rest of that mission trip, the rest of us kind of talked like this. Because our voices were gone. I mean, gone, gone for the whole week. So we have, I have done that. I'm not a snake guy. You know, there are churches that actually bring snakes to church. And they, during worship, when things get worked up, they actually play with snakes while they worship. Extreme. Can I just say that? Extreme. And can I promise you one thing? That I don't believe will ever happen here. <laughs> yeah, I want to be careful there. But yeah, we're not going to play with snakes here. The whole snake thing was an accident, right? When Paul was throwing wood into the fire, a snake was there and it bit him and he shook it off and nothing happened to him. He was healed. He was fine. Flag wavers, dancers, I'll leave that up to you. I'm not a f dancer. I'm too insecure to dance. I'm not a dancer. I'm not a flag waver. I have been hit by flags multiple times. In the midst of worship, people are, this one guy one time we were at Jesus Culture concert, he had like a 15 foot by like 10 foot flag, massive. And he, it took him like this to be able to, in the midst of worship, and I'm, I'm like totally in his presence, God's presence. And then all of a sudden, bam! <laughs> Not by the Holy Spirit, but by cotton, because this flag hit me. Like three times, I moved over 15 feet. This guy was like following me with this huge flag. So, you know, flags, that's, that's, that's okay. But there are extremes when we talk about the Holy Spirit. But we can also cross over to the other extreme when we're like, well, I read about the Holy Spirit in Acts. I see the extremes that are done. I don't want any part of any of it but I still want to follow Jesus. And so then the extreme reaction is we just block, our, block off our lives and we just kind of keep it up here. It's not a full thing because I, I believe relationship with God is a whole body experience. I mean, raising our hands, like moving, being in his presence, sometimes being loud. That's why when it was so quiet here before church this morning, I was like, let's get excited in here. I mean, there are times where it's just like, wow, this is a holy moment. Let's just enjoy this. But, but there are times like, hey, this is a celebration, so we can be excited. So I think we can have all these extremes. But sometimes that reaction just develops kind of a, our hearts be, can become cold, even callous. God is the good. God is good. Can I just say that? God is good. And the Bible says that he pours out his gifts to us as he sees fit. But I think as his kids, and we're going to read about it, we can ask him. But then it's really up to him. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, sometimes maybe it brings up like joy. You get excited about it, some of you. But maybe some of you get discouraged. Maybe some of you, it kind of bums you out. Because you have possibly gone before and asked, and you didn't get exactly what you asked for, and so it kind of disappoints you. But can I just say that you're, 
if you're a follower of Jesus, you're his kid. And it's really up to him. Like, if I was, you know, as, as a dad, I only have one, but I was a youth pastor for a long time, so I have a lot of kids. And if I just give them all the same gift, for, for a couple of them, like, wow, this is awesome. But for most of them, I was like, I don't want this. Right? So God is the giver of good gifts, and he will give his kids exactly what they need. He will give his kids exactly what they need when they need it. He is good. Now, I think sometimes with the extremes, we can also think, well, it could be just be crazy and overwhelming, but God is a God of, can I just also say that God is a God of order? And what I love about Corinthians, I mean, Corinthians, the Corinthians are just like us. They were messed up. It took two letters, plus actually a letter that's mentioned another time that we don't even have. Paul had to write at least two letters that are recorded to this group of people because they just struggled, because they struggled with the extremes. And Paul was like, okay, so in the extreme moments, just remember that our God is a God of order. So 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are really powerful passages because it, he talks about the pouring of the Holy Spirit into um, this group, to his followers. But then again, the extremes. And so then we get into Act, or 1 Corinthians 13. And if you've been to a wedding, you've heard it. Because we see love is patient, love is kind. Love, you know, does not envy, does not boast. But can I ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians 13? 1 Corinthians 13. If you need a Bible, we have Bibles in the back. They're brand new. So break one in. If you don't have a Bible and you're like, I've always wanted one, that'd be our gift to you. We'd love for you to take one home. So we've seen the passage of 1 Corinthians 13. We've, we've heard it. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. You know. So we've heard those passages. But what... What are the passages that led up to that? 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's talking about the gifts. We do not have time to talk about all the gifts today. Okay? But what I want to say is that God is the giver of those good gifts. He is. He is the giver of good gifts. But when we receive those gifts, sometimes we can get a little extreme. So he writes, he's writing like, so how do you handle these gifts when you're with a group of people in a room like this. And so verse one, Paul says, hey, if I speak in tongues of men or of angels, so he's talking about the languages. So when the Holy Spirit showed up in Acts, they went out empowered by God to speak actually language. Like they were speaking the language of the people that were in Jerusalem from all around the world. That's one language. But also Paul says, but if I speak in the in the tongue of angels. So that's a prayer language that, that we can talk about at another time. I can speak in both, either one of those, but if I don't have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So what's the key there? You can have that gift, but if you don't use that gift in love, then you are annoying Seriously, that is exactly what Paul's saying. You can be the most gifted person and have this gift, but if you don't do it out of love and compassion for your fellow brother and sister, then you are annoying. Man, I've been around annoying Christians. That they don't care about me or my, you know, they just like run me right over. And Paul's saying, that gift, it doesn't matter because you, you're not doing it out of love. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom the mysteries and all knowledge, I mean, come on, how good is that? And have faith that can actually move mountains? But if I don't love, then I am nothing. Those gifts mean nothing unless I do them out of love. If I give all I possess to the poor, and if I'm generous, and I give my body over to hardship, and, I, and then that I may boast about it, but do not have love, what do I gain? 
I gain nothing. And so the gifts of the Holy Spirit are to be done and practiced and shared out of compassion and out of love for one another. I'm not a very political person, but can I just say right now, can we just say and share out of love and compassion? Whether I don't know what side you're on. I don't know who you're voting for. Our mandate is to pray as Christians, to pray, but our also mandate is to love our neighbor as ourselves. And my neighbor might not agree with me, but my mandate is to pray for my neighbor and to love them and to put my stuff aside. Otherwise, I'm going to be annoying. I'm annoying enough already. So Jesus said, I will always be with you. I will always be with you. So then my question is, well, how can you be with me if, if you ascended into heaven? Well, what he's saying is, I will send my spirit. I have to go. Jesus told his followers, I have to go so I can. Isn't that cool? I have to so I can. And so that's what he did. He went to heaven, but he sent his Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. He is the giver of good gifts. And I have these for you this morning. So hang on. Oh, too much. Janet, can I'm in a box. Can you turn me down just a little bit? Okay. Luke. A few of you guys got that? Okay. All right. You know, he is the giver of good gifts. I'm hand sanitized. We live in a weird world right now. But God is way bigger than this. He's way bigger than hand sanitizer. If you want to trade me colors later, just do that. But for now, for speed. Oh, nice catch. Oh, you get two. I really should have had somebody do this for me. Can you do that? Do you have your mask? See, I didn't want to wear this thing anymore. Someday, people, someday. God is the giver of good gifts. I'm, I'm giving you this little gift, and when I bought it on Amazon, you know, you see the picture on Amazon, and you're thinking, oh, these are going to be awesome. They're going to be like two inch by two inch. The envelope shows up, it's about this big. And I said, this can't be what I ordered. And I open them up, and it's these. And I'm like, all right. But I'm giving you these little presents this morning. We are giving these to you because I want you to know that it's just a symbol that God is the giver of good gifts. And he is good. And Jesus' last words to his disciples was, I want you to go into the world and make disciples. I want you to go and change the world. I want you to point people to me. I want you to help them follow me. And he said, and I will always be with you. That, and that's a promise of his Holy Spirit. We cannot do the things that God is calling us to do unless his Spirit has filled us. And I'm not going to get into, do you receive the Holy Spirit when you say yes to Jesus? Or is that a separate encounter? Because there are scriptures that talk about both. I believe we can encounter God and he can... I mean, I encounter God all the time. And I believe that he's constantly filling me. Constantly. When you receive Jesus, you have been given everything that you need to live this life. But I also believe that just like when we get saved, we repent, we, we, we get baptized, we get physically baptized, but then I also believe that he baptizes us and sometimes... That happens in the moment. He's already given it to you, but sometimes the filling happens and the awareness happens at a different time. And we can see that all through the book of Acts. 
Peter shows up at Cornelius' house. Hey, you've already, received, you've already said yes to Jesus? Awesome. Now we're going to pray for you so you receive the Holy Spirit. Do they already have the Holy Spirit? They had the fullness of God already. But now there's just going to be this infilling, this pouring into. So it's less of you now and more of him. I don't know about you, but I need a lot less of me and way more of him. Way more of him. How can we do the things that Jesus has called us to do and asked us to do? It's only through his power. It's only through what the Holy Spirit has done. I want to, you to turn to Luke chapter 11. We'll finish up quickly. Because you know what that means. Marcy, I'll work on this so, so second service it won't go so long for the kids. Just joking. This is a very unique passage. I love it because I love unique. And I love when Jesus makes us think. So Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's teaching them how to pray. This is not the Sermon on the Mount. Now you're going to read, we're going to read this, and we're like, oh, this has to be the Sermon on the Mount, just Luke's account of it. No, it's not. It's a different time, but you'll pick up on it. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, verse 1. When he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray, just as John, John taught his disciples. And Jesus said this to them. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also will forgive everyone who sins against us. Kind of sounds familiar? Yeah, he's kind of saying the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. Well, every time Jesus prayed was the Lord's Prayer. Okay. And then lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said, so then he goes into a little story. Suppose you have a friend. Now I want you to capture this. Whenever you're reading stories in the Bible, just place yourself there. Put yourself in the story. Suppose you have a friend. And you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Why was bread important back then? It's because you needed it to survive. Okay, you needed bread. So God, give us today our daily bread. Allow us to eat today, God. So you go to your friend and you're asking for, for three loaves of bread. And you say this, a friend of mine is on a journey and has come to me. And I have no food to offer him. And suppose... Jesus continuing, suppose the one inside answers his friend and says, don't bother me. <laughs> you ever get a call at midnight, two o'clock in the morning, and you're like, what are you doing? Don't bother me. I've totally fixed that in my own personal life because we don't have a house phone anymore, and my cell phone is charging in the other room. So if you call me at two in the morning, it will be, have to be a divine work of God for me to even hear my phone, but sometimes I have. And suppose one on the inside says, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are already in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. And Jesus goes on to say, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you bread because of your friendship, yet because of your, this is what got me thinking, shameless audacity. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Jesus said when we pray, we need to pray and ask God with shameless audacity. Is that out of like pride? No, it's not that type of audacity. It just means out of a boldness. I like, I really need this. I really need this. So pray. Jesus says, pray. Humble yourself and pray and ask. Don't just try to grit through it. Don't just try to make it happen yourself. But ask him for what you need. And so Jesus says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, 
The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, their door will be open. And then Jesus goes on to say another little story. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If then, though, you are evil, so is Jesus calling us evil? Well, the Bible says that we have all fallen short. That we've all sinned and messed up. But out of the redemption of Jesus, we're made right. But even that, we're still messed up, right? In and of ourselves. And so Jesus is saying, man, even though you are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your kids. I mean, you're not going to give your kid a scorpion. Who's going to do that? When they're asking for something that they actually need, like, Dad, I need to eat today. And you say, eat this. No. How much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So when we pray, we pray with a confidence and with a boldness, as Hebrews says, that we come before him, his throne of grace, his throne of mercy, and he will extend those things to us because we can come in confidence with shameless audacity into his presence and ask him for what we need. Now, have we seen extremes to this passage? Yes. I've had friends that, are pray, that pray for the Cadillac. Maybe I need to update that. They pray for the Mercedes. They pray for the Beamer. They pray for the Tesla. God, if I want to walk in your blessings. So, you know, I know a church that if you're an elder in their church, your car can't be th more than three years old. I'm serious. If you're an elder in this church, a staff member in this church, your car cannot be more than three years old because if it is, you're not walking in God's blessing. That's extreme. There's nothing wrong with an 82 Celica. Well, there might be, but there's nothing wrong with you driving it. Does God care about the car that you drive? No, I don't think so. He cares about your heart. He cares about your neighbor. He cares about the people that you're going to come in contact with. And you cannot, we cannot love our neighbor as ourself without the power of the Holy Spirit. We, we cannot even love ourselves without the power of the Holy Spirit. And when I say love ourselves, I'm talking about like knowing our identity. Man, we have an identity crisis in our world right now. Because people don't know that they were created in the, in the image of the most holy God. And that they were created for a relationship with him. Not a relationship necessarily with one another to start. Initially, it was created with, for a relationship with him. We can't do any of those things unless we have the Holy Spirit. So we are four square. We believe that Jesus is Savior, that he is baptizer with the Holy Spirit, that he empowers us to live this life for him. We believe that he is our healer. Physical healing, yes. Spiritual healing, yes. Emotional healing, yes. We believe that, and we also believe that he is who he said he is, and that he is coming back. Can I invite you to stand with me? As I was thinking through like the job description of the Holy Spirit, you know, Jesus' job description was to save us from our sin and to sacrifice himself. And then he sent his Holy Spirit. And I just, I just had this great moment when I just got to sit down and like, I just started writing some of the things that who the Holy Spirit is to you and who he is to you. So just put yourself in a place where you can receive this morning. And that might just be hands in your pocket looking straight at me. But it might be eyes closed, whatever. You, whatever. He's, the Holy Spirit is your counselor. 
He is your helper. He is your teacher. He is your reminder. He is your convictor. He is your dweller. He is your filler. He is your revealer. He is the wisdom giver. He is your power. He is your guide. He is the gift giver. He is the one who seals us. He's the sealer. He is the intercessor. He is the refresher, the fruit giver, and the sanctifier. God, you're all these things. You're all these things. Lord, just wherever we're at today in this progression of faith, God, I pray that each one of us can say, God, I, I, just more, more of you, less of me. So, Lord, I do pray for a filling today. I pray for a supernatural movement of you, Jesus, that you would pour into us, that it would be more of you in us and less of us, and so we can love our neighbors, and we can do the thing that you've asked us to do, is to point people to you, Jesus, and help them walk with you in relationship. And Lord, I believe that you can do that in a supernatural way and, it, and things will happen. But I also believe that it can be a quiet, peaceful thing that you can just pour into us. And you're going to do this work. Lord, I, just, I believe that you're going to do this work in us. Lord, as we leave today, I God, I pray that you would seal the things that you're doing in us and continue and that you would be all these things. And Lord, as you are the giver of good gifts, yes, Lord, I pray that we would just be in a place where we say, yes, God, give, give me whatever I need in this moment, whatever color it might be, whatever it might look like, God, just give us those gifts. We trust you that you are the giver of the gifts and you're going to give us what we need at the exact time, at the precise time we need it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church. Be filled with him. Desire more of him. Amen.